All right, thank you guys. Thank you all very much for joining us today. I'm so sorry for the glitch on Facebook. We have today, it's a session that um, we've initiated in School of the Arts called Research In, and we invite lecturers, um, academics in their respective fields who are doing very interesting and very important work to come on board and share what they do with um, our fellow lecturers, particularly our students, and also the general public just so that we know what everybody else is doing and we're not staying in our little bubble thinking, oh, this is all there is. So today I am very, very honored and very privileged to introduce my ex-lecturer from University Putra, Malaysia, Dr. Indra. Um, she was a lecturer at UPM when I was doing my undergraduate and she's still there doing amazing, amazing work. So I'll just give you a little bit of a background of who Dr. Indra is and um, why her work is actually so important and what is it that she does. So she is um, a senior lecturer at, university, at the music department, Faculty of Ecology, UPM. She's the first PhD qualified music therapist in Malaysia and the founding president of the Malaysian Music Therapy Association, MMTA. She earned her doctorate from Florida State University as a JPA scholar and returned to Malaysia to serve as a lecturer in UPM. In 2017, she set up her first MMT program for stroke and traumatic um, brain injury rehabilitation for the Churras Rehabilitation Hospital, Southeast Asia. Sorry, I'm just admitting people as they come in. And um, has since been invited to set up a similar program for UPM's teaching hospital. In 2020, Dr. Indra was elected as the chair of the Global Crisis Intervention Commission under the World Federation of Music Therapy, and also to serve on the International Association of Music and Medicine, IAMM, Finance and Development Committee, and Executive Core Group Committee. Her most recent initiative was a music therapy crisis, crisis intervention in Beirut following the August 4th explosion. And she's currently working with the World Federation of Music Therapy to set up care teams across the globe to support future crisis intervention work. So the music department is thrilled to have Dr. Indra with us today to talk on music therapy from an academic, clinical, and research-based perspective. Um, her session today is titled An Introduction to Music Therapy from an Academic, Clinical, and Research-Based Perspective. So without further ado, um, also, I just wanna introduce two of Dr. Indra's um, undergraduate students who will be presenting along with her. We have Bobby and, I'm so sorry, I keep missing her name. Angie. Angie, yes, my dear. <laughs> my students will tell you I'm horrible with names. After the fourth year, I do the same thing. I'll point at one student and I'll call them something else. And they already <laughs> know that they, and they know they have to just respond and like, yes. <laughs> so Angie and Bobby, welcome, along with Dr. Indra. So um, I'll let you um, take it away. Thank you so much, Praveena. It's such a pleasure to be here and seeing you brings back many fond memories when you were a student in UPM. And it gives us great pride to see how far you have developed the program in USM. And it is our pleasure to actually contribute in some small way with the current work that we are doing. So music therapy is something, of course, that a lot of people are fascinated by. I hope that this session, which Dr. Pravina has kindly arranged just for USM students will be something which enlightens you and helps to answer some of the questions you may have about what music therapy is and also to give this session to help us to also dis demystify what research is because a lot of times, I think in universities like USM, UPM, we are encouraged to do research to some extent. There's a lot of incentives given for us to pursue research. But as music students, as individuals who may not have joined the program because we wanted to do research, but because we thought by coming into a music program like this, we were training to become musicians. The opportunity to do research sometimes is quite confusing. And this is the same challenge that we face in UPM. So I'm so glad that Bobby and Angie have joined us today because I think they have really, really embraced this whole research journey. And the work that we're doing right now 
as part of their final year project, has actually been born out of their interest and their passion for pursuing music therapy, but looking specifically at how they can use music therapy-based interventions to help dementia patients. So we'll be giving you a glimpse of how that is possible towards the end of the session. For now, if you would allow me to share my screen so that I can give you a slideshow and hopefully give you some helpful pointers about what music therapy is and how does research actually contribute towards the advancement of music therapy and why it is so important. So let me just screen share and I'm going to start from the beginning. Okay, so when I was invited by Dr. Pravina to do this session, we were having some conversation about how a lot of people don't realize music therapy is actually research evidence-based. And what does that mean? From the perspective of what music therapy is, some of you may have heard that it is a profession that looks into ways that you can use music to help with healing. And it also is used often to facilitate recovery and to promote health. So there are aspects of music being used to help by improving someone's condition in, of health if they are in a healthcare setting or to even spur rehabilitation. Uh, Dr. Pravina mentioned earlier in my introduction that we do work in Chiras Rehab Hospital. But we also use music for general wellness and quality of life. So we are looking at all these different stages of how music can help improve our human functioning as well as our health. But what is different about music therapy is because very often, I'm sure some of you have already heard of how music therapy is being used with special needs children. Sometimes we use music therapy with stroke patients. And if you pause and think for a moment, all these are vulnerable populations. And because they have certain limitations of health, because they are in positions that are compromised, they might be enduring a lot of extra struggle, they might be going through a lot of chronic pain. We have to be extra careful with what we are doing using music as a form of intervention. So the idea is that everything in music therapy is backed up by an evidence base of research. I will explain a little bit more as we go down the slides what that means. But it's also goal-driven, it is targeted, and it unfolds within that context of a therapeutic relationship. It means that as a music therapist, part of our training involves building up a relationship of trust with the patient. So the patient is able to not only participate in the treatment, but the patient is cooperative and willing to engage with all the different types of music activities that we may present to them. It also means that the training required of a music therapist will actually be very, very specialized. And you have to be credentialed as a music therapist. My own training was in the US. And I know there are many questions from students who have come to UPM who are asking from outside UPM about whether there are opportunities in Malaysia to train to become a qualified music therapist. At the moment, no. But what we are working towards in UPM is the setting up of a Masters of Music Therapy program because there is a request from the Ministry of Health and there are plans currently underway to actually set up that master's program. Hopefully within the next five years, we'll be actually able to produce our own music therapy master's graduates in Malaysia. So if any of you are interested and want to know more about opportunities, please keep in touch. And by all means, through Dr. Pravina, let's see how this session actually shares certain things about music therapy that you might be exploring as a potential career pathway in the future. So music therapy is also something that is very systematic. There are stages in the process. We are looking at different ways of using music in all its creative possibilities. So in the music therapy work that we do, we use performing skills, we use compositional skills, we may use technology skills, we use our music theory, every aspect of music training, which you would be exposed to while studying in USM or even in UPM, 
that is potentially the kind of musical skills we will harness for use in music therapy. So what do we focus on? We are using music to stimulate, support and rehabilitate human functioning. And we target all these different domains from the cognitive skills, that means ways to use music to stimulate thinking and the way the brain functions, to our emotions, to our social interaction, as well as to influence human behavior. And we do that with individuals one-to-one -one, as much as with groups. So in music therapy, we are applying music into both individual as well as group contexts. So when we use music for treatment, these are just some of the examples of what research has shown music therapy can do. It can help to reduce pain. It can help to reduce stress and anxiety, improve communication skills, promote. Rehabilitation is the recovery process in medical treatment. Very often when we are working with patients who have an illness like stroke, their recovery is not instant. And there's going to be a period of recovery where they need a lot of support. And that rehabilitation process to recover their health as much as possible involves a lot of intensive therapy. So that's a major part of the work that we are doing in UPM. Also to improve socialization. Some of you may have heard that with special needs populations, there is a level of limitation when it comes to social and communication skills. So we use music as a stimulus and a support to help kids to actually develop these skills. Using music to improve coping as well as to enhance memory and cognition. So this is just a very, very brief snapshot and there's many, many other things that music can do in a targeted way. So what are some of the clinical applications looking specifically at medical music therapy? I know there is some pre-existing interest in USM, specifically in your campus on Kuban Korean, that's looking at medical applications of music therapy. And I've been contacted in the past by Dr. Gary Kwan and some of the team in the um, HUSM, Kuban Korean, and they have been asking me questions about medical applications of music therapy. So this is one of the reasons why I just wanted to introduce it to USM students. So we operate in the same way. We are doing music therapy in a hospital context with both group as well as individual formats. And we use different levels of musical engagement. It can be active music making, where we get patients to participate and to be highly involved in the actual process of music making, or receptive music interventions, which has more to do with passive music listening and responding to the music, but perhaps not in such an active and dynamic way. So we use all of that, depending on the patient's needs. And we often work as part of a multidisciplinary team. Now, this is very important because when we are going into a hospital context, we are referring primarily to the primary medical specialists and the treatment team. And so we attach music experiences. We incorporate our musical intervention into their primary treatment goals. And of course, consult-based service is very much to do with, depending on the patient's condition, doctors will usually approach me and say, we think that such and such a patient could benefit from music therapy. So then we will consult with them and decide what's the best way to deliver music therapy support. So how is music used as an intervention? It could be a stimulus. It could be used for helping the patient to better focus or even as a distraction from pain. It could be a cue for a relaxation response, especially when you have patients who are in a hospital setting that are experiencing a lot of tension, a lot of fear, and their muscles are all seizing up. There's research to show that when a patient is in a high state of tension, the blood flow is affected. And so if you have a patient that's going into surgery, for example, the very fact that they are in a state or tension is actually going to interfere with their recovery process. So we are using music as a stimulus to help to aid relaxation so that the process of recovery following surgery, following treatment will actually be smoother because the patient's physical body, not just their response, will be more conducive for the uh, rehabilitation process. A masking agent, sometimes what happens is especially if you have been to a hospital, for example, in an ICU, in, in an intensive care unit, there are lots of machines and there'll be lots of sounds and there's lots of clicks and buzzes of the machines that are 
often keeping the patient alive or helping the patient with their respiration. But it's very invasive. It's very disturbing for the patient. It interferes with their sleep. It just adds to their stress and their trauma. So sometimes we use music actually to change the sound environment to help to reduce their sensitivity to the noise because the music is helping to mask the unpleasant sounds and helping to create a more conducive atmosphere for their rest and recovery. Carrier of information that's used a lot, especially when we are applying music into special education, where we are using music to fill in the gaps with their learning by using songs, using music and movement games to actually teach them academic concepts. And of course, I mentioned just now with the masking agent, this also goes together with the positive environmental stimulus. One thing that I used to do when I was uh, in the States was sometimes you would go into the pediatric ward where the hospital is dealing with children who may need prolonged hospitalization and they're staying in the ward so their schooling is interfered they don't really have the normal kind of growing up experiences that most children have and that interferes with their development so we use music as a way to normalize the environment if they can't go out to school how can we bring the school into the ward using music and creating experiences that help them to feel comfortable in the hospital to feel more normal so very often you find that in music therapy, we are talking about these different considerations, that the treatment needs to be appropriate for the age and developmental level. It also has to cater to the patient's music preference, their level of familiarity with the music. In Malaysia, very often I find when we are doing music therapy work, in government hospitals especially, if we are using music from the local culture, if you're dealing with Malay patients, Chinese patients, we try to bring music that comes from their cultural background. They tend to have a much better response. So musical preference level of familiarity is very, very important to create that association and ability to respond more effectively to the music intervention. Also called characteristics of music, cultural context, pre patients' previous experiences are also important. And so all this again, goes back to that familiarity and what kind of relationship do they have with the music. I would never choose music based on my preference, but I will always try my best to get to know what the patients like, what they are more likely to respond to, and then use that kind of music for intervention. One of the things that you will notice as you're getting more into the research aspect of our music therapy work is that we consult theories, we use various theories. The theory of neuroplasticity is used a lot when we are doing music work with neuro rehab. But for purposes of general treatment, we are looking a lot at the biopsychosocial model. And this is actually a theory of healing and health that encourages us to look at the healing process as a comprehensive overview of the patient. So we're looking at biological factors, we're looking at psychological factors and social factors. We are not just looking at the treatment itself, but we're looking at what other variables, what other influences may be affecting the way the patient responds to medical treatment. So it's a comprehensive approach. So why the biopsychosocial model? When we look at illness, very often the suffering and the struggle is not just to do with the biological aspects of the illness. So if someone has a um, stroke, for example, and they are inflicted with a chronic illness that creates a very, very long recovery process, and it's something which the patient has no choice but just to cope with, then we are looking at the etiology, what caused the stroke, what is the nature and the prognosis of the stroke. But we are also looking at the other variables, other factors that may be affecting the patient's response to recovery. So there's mental health issues as well. There are going to be psychological factors like stress. Sometimes patients go into depression, especially when they were not expecting to suddenly get a stroke out of nowhere. And their whole world is turned upside down because of the stroke. So you have to also take into consideration that the patient beyond the biological aspects of their stroke is also dealing with a lot of mental health um, issues such as depression, anxiety, perhaps some of them are actually feeling demotivated in their treatment. And social factors, what about caregiver support? Do they have family members there who are able to provide the care they need because they are 
in recovery and they're not fully able to look after themselves. So the psychological factors, social factors, these are very much going to influence the outcome of treatment. And so we are looking holistically at the patient's experience of care and to predict besides the biological aspects of whatever they're going through with their sickness or their illness condition, what other factors are at play in terms of the psychology, the social aspects and so forth, even the environment that will ultimately influence the total outcome of treatment. So when we are looking at these things from a research angle, it means that our overview of the patient's experience is much broader. And we are taking into account what are the many, many different factors that could be affecting the patient's ability to respond. Now, one thing that is very progressive about the biopsychosocial approach, and it's actually something that is favored very much even now in uh, healthcare settings in the US. I've had many conversations with colleagues in the American Music Therapy Association, and the research shows very much that very often it is not just the treatment and the quality of the treatment that will determine how successful the outcome is because patient factors are actually a big part of the whole process. And if you can get the patient to be more empowered, to be more likely to want to take over ownership of their recovery process, that they are activated, that they are enabled, that they are engaged, that means they are participating fully in the treatment process, they are cooperative, that actually is a very, very big catalyst to predict whether the patient is going to be successful in terms of their recovery or not. So one thing that I remember reading in research in counselling, patient factors to determine the quality of outcome of treatment is actually as much as 70%. So no matter what you do, no matter how much you try your best to intervene and to give them the best possible care and support, that only goes to about 30% of the outcome of treatment. The other 70%, the majority, actually depends a lot on the patient. So here we are from a music therapy perspective, needing to pay attention to these things because we may put a lot of effort into trying to develop our music activities to the best of our ability, but without realizing that the patient is actually going to be reacting beyond just their music experience to other psychological factors, to other environmental factors, family, social factors that could be influencing their ability to respond. That is only looking at the problem that the patient is facing from a very limited perspective. So this holistic way, of looking at the patient's experience is far more effective and more accurate also. So what is music therapy research? I'm using that biopsychosocial uh, approach as a segue to introduce to you why is it is important to look into these research aspects. So research is effectively a systematic inquiry that helps us to new discoveries. And then as we are doing this systematic study to observe what is going on in that particular situation, we start to observe, we record, we document. There are a lot of techniques. There's a whole research process that guides the way we conduct that kind of observation. But music therapy research in particular is looking at ways we can conduct that kind of systematic inquiry about our music therapy processes. And that is so important as part of music therapy. With every session that we are doing with a patient, we cannot just hope for the best. We prepare a session, we present it to the patients and we assume that they are going to get better or that somehow that music session is going to impact them positively. There has to be ways for us to assess, to monitor, and to be able to chart the progress of that intervention to know for sure whether by the end of the intervention, we are likely to help to promote the positive outcome or not. And if it doesn't deliver the positive outcome that we desire, why? What can be changed? What do we have to do differently? So the research process is very much embedded within the interventions that we conduct in UPM. So music therapy researchers can use many different philosophical perspectives. We use a lot of psychological orientation, behavioral psychology. The school that I was trained in the US is more behaviorist, but there's also cognitive psychology, there's humanistic psychology, and all those are the psychological overlays that guide the perspectives of our intervention. But we also use many different methodologies. There are music therapy research that focus more on 
doing experiments, randomized controlled trials, which are much harder to achieve, but uh, a lot more what we consider as higher quality evidence. We also can have case studies on the other end, which are more popular, but do not necessarily give us the kind of results that help us to predict the general response in the population. So there are strengths and weaknesses with different types of methodologies. But we are also, as I mentioned just now, bringing in theory. So the biopsychosocial uh, model is one, but the theory of neuroplasticity is another one I mentioned. Depending on the topic, we often work in multidisciplinary teams. So we will have expertise that come from different areas of research working together to be able to form a more comprehensive view of that phenomenon. So what is the fuss about evidence-based music therapy practice? According to American Music Therapy Association, which is very much uh, one of the benchmarks we use for guiding research practice, we are talking about an approach to conducting music therapy that integrates the best available research with the music therapist's expertise and the needs, values, and preferences of the individuals. So we are not just randomly consulting research but we are systematically trying to tap into the latest, the most high quality research evidence that we can find. In fact, the encouragement in music therapy uh, evidence-based practice is to use Cochrane reviews, which is a medical gold standard for determining whether a particular treatment is actually valid and reliable. So the practice of evidence-based medicine means we are all the time actively incorporating research into our planning, into our designing of music interventions and trying to use the most updated findings to inform our practice. So the two actually work like a complement. We are not going in blind when we do interventions. It doesn't matter whether, you know, when I was trained, that was the standard practice of the day. I need to know what are the updates. I need to know whether there have been any improvements on that kind of intervention that have since been discovered and to use what is known to be best practice at this point in time. So music therapists are therefore frequently involved in research. And of course, you will find in Malaysia right now, many things are still developing. And there is a lot of research being done in UPM because we are a research university and most of it is being done through student projects because we spend a lot of time working with students, training students and guiding them through this process, pro, through this process and trying to discover music therapy based interventions that work for our own local population. I know UPM, uh, USM is also very active in using music in different kinds of healing contexts, including with traditional music as well. So it's very, very exciting right now to be in Malaysia because we have all these possibilities for collaboration, for ways that we can spur further development of research in this area. So the research is used in the field of music therapy to provide evidence about how well music therapy works, how effective it is. It is also used to help educate people about music therapy. And this could be as much to educate the uh, medical doctors that we work with, when we work in special education settings, we have to work with special education teachers and having that research evidence, the black and white proof of what works, what doesn't work and what can potentially work better is definitely uh, an asset. We also talk about having a mindset of conscientious and judicious use of the current best evidence. And this is something which we encourage a lot with our students. So we're actually very fanatical with our students when it comes to preparing their literature review to make sure that they are not just using research that is available in Malaysia because there's not that much research available in our local context in music therapy. But also to bring in the best of whatever they can find from overseas where it's more advanced and where more research has been done. And then to see to what extent we can culturally contextualize and apply those findings in Malaysia. So why do we promote evidence-based practice? Ultimately, research helps us to ensure that the music therapy techniques we use and we develop have been sufficiently tried and tested, that they are safe and that they are valid and accurate before they are even administered to human beings. Going back to what I mentioned earlier, that we often work with vulnerable populations. We need to make sure that whatever methods we use, whatever techniques we're introducing, has already been tried and tested to a certain standard of rigor. And is not only safe and has minimal risks, but ideally has been proven to be effective. 
then we can confidently deliver it to the patients knowing that we are giving the best possible experience to help spur their treatment outcomes. And of course, ongoing research is a must to continue to update what we are doing. And this is what helps to inform our knowledge base as well as advanced clinical practice. So music therapy in Malaysia right now is going through a lot of active development. And in UPM, what we are trying to do to spur the research development is now being combined with the World Federation of Music Therapy because opportunities have opened up. And one thing that I want to share is at the heart of what we do in UPM research is community transformation. All these pictures that you see here have come out of our various research projects. And some pictures involve patients in hospitals. I've gotten the permission to share for educational purposes, but also some of them have to do also with older adults because UPM has an Institute of Aging. And you can see that we work with different populations from different ages and stages. And some of them are what we consider well elderly. Others have chronic illness conditions. Okay, so let me now um, perhaps pass over the time to Angie and Bobby because I know that we have uh, allocated some time for them and I just want to ask how are we doing with time, Praveena? We're doing okay. We're okay with time. As long as you guys are okay, we're okay. <laughs> so I actually have more material but I think for now it's better that we segue over to Angie and to Bobby and let okay. them share and let's see if your students have any questions because I'm very, very conscious that your students actually want to ask questions and I want to make sure we give them enough time. I hope they open their mouths and ask questions and not shy away. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we'll, we'll let your students go first and then maybe we'll open up for questions and then you can wrap up everything at the end. Yeah? Definitely. Thank okay. you, Pravina. No problem. Okay, so I guess I'm taking over from here. Thank you so much, Dr. Indra, for the for that awesome overview of music therapy. And thank you, Dr. Pravina, for having us here today. Uh, okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Bobby Rose, and uh, just a short overview about me. Uh, I'm a diploma graduate from UITM. I did diploma in music, and now I'm doing my de degree, bachelor's of music in UPM. And yeah, like Dr. Indra mentioned, I am in my final year doing research in music therapy, but I'm focusing more on drumming aspects. So let me just pull this up real quick. Okay. So my research focuses on music therapy drumming or percussive based music therapy. And what that means is, what that means is it's basically any music therapy activities that utilizes percussive approaches, instruments and methods to trigger any behavioral response. In, the approaches will be uh, shown later on and the methods, but the instruments here are, um, for music students, you would know, uh, percussions are things that rattle, things that are hit, things that are struck, not only limited to, in Malaysian context, uh, the Istana Budaya actually mentioned that alat perkusi is uh, instrument yang dipalu, diketuk, dan dipukul. It's not just that, it's all the shakers on the maracas and all the toys and stuff. And the most important thing about music therapy drumming activities is that it has to be administered by a board certified music therapist, which means in every sense of the word, this is different from community music. And the most common one in music therapy, in, in drumming is drum circles. And those are more of um, sessions that teach simple interventions, methods, like anyone can learn over a short period of time, usually a, a, a short a weekend session, um, master classes and so on. Music therapy drumming has looked into a wide, has created a wide research on its own and there have been a lot of literature review pertaining to it. And it actually, there have actually been researches done by uh, Bill Matney and, and Shuffle. Bill Matney is a professor in University of Kentucky that does actually percussive based music therapy research like thoroughly for his PhD. And he was talking about how uh, drumming based interventions that utilizes improvisational methods actually helps promote behavioral support, emotional expression, social awareness, and social improvement. These are, as Dr. Indra mentioned, these are some of the therapeutic areas of uh, therapeutic goals that uh, uh, therapists and the clients will work towards together. 
And drum playing actually helps with emotional expressions as it presents for sound elements such as tempo, dynamics, and timing. So it becomes uh, acoustic cues for the clients so that they know when to uh, act on certain reactions and when to respond accordingly because it's been presented for them. For tra traumatic soldiers uh, undergoing PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, music therapy drumming actually also helps with group members talking to each other using music. This is a non-verbal manner in which the members talk to each other. They, they are speaking to each other by playing, by communicating with each other on the drums or on the percussive uh, percussions. And because of how percussions and drums are, are framed, it actually strengthens the bonds of clients and therapists to work towards the therapy goal with more synergy. My research looks further more into persons with dementia as, as does Angie, but like I said, mine is more music therapy drumming for PWDs. And there has been a lot of research that shows that uh, clients with mild to moderate cognitive impairments are also able to achieve improved communication skills through percussive playing. And even those and there's even been literature that shows improved cognitive functioning. And communication skills, cognitive functioning, these are very important because uh, dementia clients are the highlight, the hallmark of their symptoms are cognitive decline. And percussive instruments because they are, percussive instruments because they are adjustable and flexible because they're usually repetitive and predictable in the activities. So they are very accessible they are very accessible activities for those to counter multiple therapeutic goals. And percussion activities actually help those with cognitive impairments through improvisation, through accompaniment, or even mirror playing in the sessions. And as you can see, percussion also allows uh, PWDs to participate in stimulating music experiences. And even those with severe, like very, um, the worst case of dementia. And research actually shows increased in, in responsiveness and engagement by them when there's an involvement of percussion and drumming. And because how drumming actually helps with cognition and physical skills because of their playing, their motor movement, their fine and gross motor movement, it actually develops into improved groom bonding for the persons with dementia amongst themselves, between the participants and the therapist. And of course, another a uh, hallmark factor of dementia is BPSD, uh, behavioral psych and psychological symptoms of dementia, which is uh, reduced through percussive interventions. As you can see, uh, there are researchers that show record great reduction of anxiety and agitation in PWDs. My research looks into the connection of both of those, music therapy drumming and persons with dementia, uh, with mild to moderate dementia, but delivered in an online platform and it's called teletherapy. Any therapies that are done online at a distance. And the objective of my research is to find the relative relationship between their musical improvements and their cognitive changes. And my research uses the taxonomy of drumming experiences in music therapy created by Bill Matney and Kalani Das. And this is a range of different methods for the therapist to carry out the sessions. I won't go too much into detail on this one because it could be quite a stretch to explain each and every one. But these are traditionally, uh, these are essentially traditional drumming, traditional accompaniment between one another and with the therapist, guided interactive drumming according to the therapist's uh, cues and instructions, clinical improvisation within the context, drum playing, technique-oriented playing according to whatever techniques the therapist would uh, mention, composing according to percussive needs, and even the tactile response to the instruments themselves, and even just as Dr. Indra mentioned, uh, receptive music therapy, percussion listening. In my research, the changes in level of drumming and percussive playing is measured according to the rhythmic acuity measurement scale, also made by Matney and Das. Yes, I'm a big I'm a big fan of Das and Matney and all the researchers. And it will be done for the assessment and development of specific rhythmic skills that can be used in clinical setting. Of course, originally, the scale was done for music therapy students in their undergrad and postgraduate training, but it, it's also uh, manipulated to be used in a clinical setting as well. And there are different components such as response, the timing, 
the fortitude, the resiliency, the orientation, the frequency, the variation, and the division. And, you know, again, these are components that uh, both uh, music therapy students and music students are familiar with, but how it's used is in a clinical medical setting. And according to the changes in level of drumming, it will be cross compared to the MMSE, the mini mental state exam, which is the most common cognitive examination for dementia clients. And the scores will be compared after the sessions. So that's all for me. For those interested, you can go through these uh, references that I've had. So as you can see, all the references that I've put on are relating to music therapy, music therapy drumming, and even psychology of music and all the different aspects of music therapy. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Angie and I'm a classical turned jazz pianist, um, chorister and percussionist in UPM. And I'm currently in my final year doing my music therapy research, which seeks to explore the perceptions and experience of people with dementia and their family caregivers on music activities as measured by the music in dementia assessment scale. So to give you all a brief overview, dementia is a neurodegenerative disease that significantly impacts health and well-being of the individuals in several aspects of life such as memory, language, perception and executive functioning. And while Alzheimer's disease is the most prevalent type of dementia representing up to 75% of its cases. And so the prevalence of dementia in Malaysia is estimated at 0.126% and 0.454% in 2020 and 2050, respectively. And this poses issue of ways to enhance and increase the quality of life and support for dementia patients. And meanwhile, there are many family members who view dementia symptoms as normal aging, and hence they do not seek for any medical treatments. So in light of the recent COVID-19 pandemic, the requirement for social distancing has inevitably affected persons with dementia and their family caregivers. And under local circumstances, initiatives from local communities were carried out to help the elderly and vulnerable uh, to help them get through difficult times. So therefore, my current study sees the need to evaluate musical engagement of dementia patients in Malaysia who may not be capable of giving concrete verbal feedback on their experiences while participating in music activities and to explore the potential for dementia patients and their caregivers to be involved in joint music activities based on their perspe respective perceptions to determine if music activities can benefit them in ways that promote positive interaction and reduce possible risk of side effects of pharmacological treatment. And hence, the study will be following the latest trends in response to the COVID-19 situation that incorporates teletherapy, as what Bobby said earlier. And um, the result outcomes are anticipated to help increase stimulation, positive social interaction, as well as the quality of life for dementia patients, reduce caregiver burden and stress, and to improve the overall mood and mental health. And this understanding may have implications for musical involvement in dementia, especially here in Malaysia. And the current study also aims to assess the perspective and musical experiences of dementia patients and their caregivers using semi-structured interviews and to determine the levels of interest, response, initiation, involvement and enjoyment of dementia patients and their caregivers in response to a music activity as administered via teletherapy and measured using the music in dementia assessment scale and to gauge their overall experiences towards several music-based uh, activities. And building on this literature on music-based activities and evidences of uh, this MEDAS being validated to be a rigorous quantitative outcome measure, which has high level of clinical relevance and the outcome from these sections will likely to influence the perceptions and experiences of both the patients and caregivers as measured by the MEDAS. So what literature reviews have to say about the challenges of COVID-19 and its impact on dementia patients is that singing and speaking may be a source of viral transmission of coronavirus through infectious droplets. And besides that, uh, therapy practices need to be recognized, nationwide guidance on taking precautions, and even therapies and interns are highly advised to avoid direct contact with patients, adhere to physical distance, and switch to online or virtual services where it's visible and appropriate. And there already have initiatives that are really uh, begin to provide therapy for dementia patients from the comfort of their own homes. And so according to the American Music Therapy Association, the music therapy needs to adapt delivery models based on evolving circumstances and hence they have developed this three-tiered approach for a successful virtual music therapy delivery for their clients. And so this uh, research is an exploratory pilot study 
which is a single case study design adopting only small sample sizes. And this design is both feasible and appropriate for use in music therapy clinical practice settings, particularly for testing the effectiveness and interventions for individuals or small groups. And this study is also primarily quantitative approach using, using the measurement scale, which is MIDAS incorporated with semi-structured interviews, which will be held before and after the weekly music activity sessions to better understand the participants' perceptions and experiences on the sessions and assessment process for the refinement of future research. And these are the proposed number of subject participants, which is 10 from each dementia patients, including male and female aged 50 and above together with their caregivers respectively for a three-week music activity session with uh, 30 minutes each week through referral from Alzheimer's Disease Foundation Malaysia, ADFM. And the mini mental state exam will be also used for screening of patients who are part of the connective disability at risk populations. And the pre and post interviews along with the activity sessions will be carried out through Zoom as it supports HIPAA compliance. And these are my inclusion and exclusion, uh, exclusion criteria for my participants. And the main thing that I need is the patient living with their family caregivers in their own home. And also they need to have smart gadgets such as good internet connection, microphone, built-in laptop camera or external web camera to carry out the interviews and the sessions. So what is MIDAS actually? So MIDAS is an observational outcome measure uh, designed to evaluate the musical engagement of people from moderate to advanced stages of dementia who may not be capable of giving concrete verbal feedback on their experiences. So this instrument is also developed as a same day scale to capture the presentation of the dementia person on that day. And they're here and now experiences on the day which means something significant for them. And the rates of this instrument are required to reflect on the optimal level of the person for each visual analog scale items, which are levels of interest, response, initiation, involvement, and enjoyment, observed by the rater in person on that day and to make a vertical mark on the 100 millimeter line. So as you can see from this example, which is the staff MIDAS form, when you can see uh, none at all to the highest, that is a straight line uh, across the the forms. So this line is actually measured accordingly to the 100 millimeter line. And there is also a need for consistency of the same caregiver to rate the patient, uh, which is important to ensure accuracy. And the two MIDAS forms should be completed per participant by the same rater on that day of the intervention to evaluate potential changes. So based on literature review, MIDAS also allowed them to capture the interest, reaction, and communication rates that were not accounted for using other measuring instruments, and also to evaluate um, the patient well-being and engagement before and during each session. So how do you actually, pro uh, the procedure to administer the MIDAS is that Firstly, the family caregiver rater takes a moment to reflect on the overall well-being of the dementia patient on the day in order to complete the before form. So the researcher, which is me, is to complete two forms, which are the beginning and during form immediately after each session. So the beginning form is based on the observation of the uh, persons with dementia during their first five minutes of the session as a baseline score for that day. And the during form is based on the observation of the persons with dementia during their best five minutes of that session judged as the most clinically important for that particular patient for that day. And the family caregiver raters who complete the before form should also complete the after form, not immediately after the session, but several hours after the session to evaluate the short-term effects of the intervention. And there will also be training for the family caregiver raters whereby introductory practice sessions will be held before the first music activity session and it's also for them to understand the concept of the VAS items and to have sufficient knowledge of the person that they are rating and the importance to stop and reflect on the presentations of the patient in relation to their unique optimal level. So um, meanwhile the validity of MIDAS is that it has undergone through meetings and expert or peer consultation and has good psychometric properties, although with limited sample sizes. And for its justification, there are no sections in the English MIDAS that are irrelevant to local context and is appropriate for assessing music activities conducted by non-therapists, such as the family caregivers and the student researchers like myself. And so now let us move on quickly to the procedure as to how it's going to be carried out. After I've assessed the participants and gotten them through purposive sampling, I'll be briefing them on what this research project entails and 
as well as getting their consent and then conducting a pre-interview to assess their perspective towards music-based activities and the aspects of musical experiences that are important for them and the kind of responses caregivers will observe when certain experiences are meaningful for the patients. And then I'll be conducting a MIDAS training session for the family caregivers and handing out the MIDAS forms, then commence the music activity sessions which will last for three weeks. Then the researcher and family caregiver waiters will, be, uh, will fill up the respective MIDAS forms during those sessions and I'll be conducting a post-interview after the last session to gauge their overall experiences of dementia patients and their caregivers towards those activities. So continuing on how this whole teletherapy works is that music activity sessions and the interviews are to be held uh, in a group setting like above and to be done on a platform that supports HIPAA compliance because that is very important. And step-by-step -step procedure is to be provided attached with a Zoom URL link for the participants who will be logging on for easy access prior to the sessions uh, as seen on the right. And both interviews and the sessions will be screen recorded for easy and accurate transcription and will be accountable to ethical compliance and will only be used for research purposes. So as you can see, these are the examples that I've uh, shown and illustrated. On the top left is the participant and facilitator as to how uh, the interviews will to be conducted. And on the top right is um, a speaker view whereby the facilitation of the music-based activity sessions were to be conducted and to be carried out where um, I as the facilitator can be seen on the big screen and the participants can see me as well. And then at the bottom is a gallery view, Zoom gallery view of the participants, including the facilitator. So uh, as for data analysis and interpretation, the transcripts from pre and post interviews and the raw data from the MIDAS forms will be subjected to thematic analysis and descriptive statistics analysis respectively to compare changes between the researcher's score, uh, which are the effects during the session and the family caregiver scores, observable effect following the session and to be interpreted into a context as follows. So that's all for me and thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Bobby and Angie. That was very, very insightful and I, I must say it is amazing to see undergraduate students speak so fluently and eloquently and so confidently presenting. I, for one, for a split second, I was like, ah, postgraduate students. Yeah, so congratulations. Well done. You must be very proud of the work you're doing. And I hope it does not stop at the undergraduate level. And you guys take this work further because it's amazing work that you're doing with Dr. Indra. And I'm sure it has an impact on the community that you all are reaching out to. So um, should we open up for questions, guys, music students from USM? Um, and also the general public who've tuned in today to listen into this session. If you've got any questions, you can either type it out in the chat box or um, you can switch on your audio and your video and just shoot your question to either Bobby, Angie, or to even Dr. Indra herself. If possible, direct your questions to Dr. Indra. She's the lecturer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they might be interested in what kind of drumming you're doing with your, right? With the work that you're yeah. doing. Yeah. To uh, counter what Bobby has just shared, please feel free to ask both Angie and Bobby. <laughs> because I know that their research is potentially something that some of you may be interested in. And the reason why we are all here today is to give you a chance to ask your burning questions about music therapy and also find out about some of the research work that's being done in Malaysia. And I'm actually very, very keen to see how we can reach out and assist. Okay, we have one question here from Yen Zheng. She's actually our first year music student. What is the qualification to become a music therapist? So music therapy actually requires uh, accredited training and you usually will go on to a program run by a university that has the credentials to actually qualify music therapists. At this point in Malaysia, we don't have that yet. But in the US, what they have is a separate certification board that just looks at ways that the different music programs offering music therapy training actually will comply to professional standards. So this is something that we are working on in baby steps in Malaysia. 
but it's important for you to um, know that right now in Malaysia we don't have anything yet but we do have actually programs in Thailand which have been running for more than 10 years but it's very much about Thai culture and we also have students from UPM who have been preparing at undergraduate level like Bobby, like Angie and have subsequently gone over to the States and are now doing their masters in music therapy. So they will be certified under the US system. Um, but if any of you are interested in it, it's something which we are looking towards because there has been, uh, as I said, a directive from the Ministry of Health as well for UPM to look at it. So we are very keen to make sure that when we talk about qualifying music therapists, it really has to fulfill the professional standards that have been set, not just in Malaysia, but internationally. And that's part of what I'm doing right now, being involved with all this international work. Uh, Dr. Indra, may I ask you a question on that mm -hmm. note? Uh, mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Tian. I'm from the general public um, and I've been uh, looking into the sector for a while. Um, so my question would be, uh, after the Chandana's forum uh, and the, the, uh, the last two weeks, someone mentioned about, you know, wouldn't it be great if uh, psychotherapists or psychiatrists issue a diagnose, uh, uh, you know, for someone who's going through depression, you know, go to choir, you know, as, 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 a, as, a, as a therapy. And um, from that, um, well, what I did was I basically called up a psychiatrist and asked, you know, what would it take for you to issue that? And so I'm wondering uh, in terms of the program or what's available in terms of uh, programs in Malaysia, but also especially UPM, um, what is the kinds of research uh, and that are supported? Because I know the work on dementia is uh, largely what you do, and so it's the, the support around that is very robust. But I'm wondering about uh, what are the kinds of, uh, of uh, inquiry is, uh, is available uh, to do within the research setting. Um, thank you so much for the question and for your interest, Tian Yun. Actually, in UPM, we are doing many different kinds of music therapy-based research with different populations. Dementia is just the population that both Bobby and Angie happen to be interested in, so we created that pathway for them. But we do a lot of voice rehabilitation research with Parkinson's patients, and we have produced PhD students, final year project students, one of them who is now in the US pursuing her master's actually focus on Parkinson's patients. And for her project, we focus on mental health and coping, and we use songwriting. So we actually do a lot of different types of research project classes that have to do with older adults with chronic illness, the well elderly, but we also have special needs education uh, areas as well. And to answer your first question about you know, whether a psychiatrist would be qualified, well, in the same way that I would not give you a, med a prognosis or diagnosis like a medical doctor, because that's not my primary area of training, you will have to refer to the credential professional in the field. The same goes for psychologists, the same goes for every other allied health, whether it's speech therapy, whether it's physical therapy and so forth. So what I would say is we have to be very careful. I think it's wonderful that there are many people who see the benefits of music, who are interested to extend psychological support using music. But what is so important is when we are trying to offer these activities to try to work with the qualified professionals. So in UPM, we are very strict about the fact that, for example, I have um, students interested in helping Parkinson's patients. And that is an area of training that I was qualified to do in the US. But when we work in Malaysia, we work alongside the Parkinson specialists from UM Medical Center, from UPM, with the Malaysian Parkinson's Disease Association as well, to ensure that, that interdisciplinary team that we set up has all the appropriate expertise and people who are actually qualified to do that diagnosis and to administer. So we do the music part because that is our qualification, but they will handle some of the other medical aspects and we work as a collaborative team. Does that help to answer your question? It incredibly robust. Yes, that's what I was hoping to hear from the team as well as uh, the skills-based approach more so than uh, pathways and that this is incredibly promising. Thank you. I think what is so encouraging is to know that, you know, we have a lot of good people in Malaysia right now who have different areas of training and are interested in forming these collaborations. In fact, one of the things that Dr. Prabhupada and myself when we were talking about setting up this session, we are hoping to offer more 
education and awareness, more opportunities. So that students are, who are coming into USM to UPM or just in general looking for ways to get the training and to get proper qualification, we can guide them in that direction. We even have a Malaysian Music Therapy Association, which you heard of in the beginning, and they are also actively involved in helping to set the standards. So we need all these different components. We need all these different professional bodies working together to ensure that we are safeguarding the ethical standards and making sure that whatever we do in practice is also aligned with the international standards. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've got a few questions on the chat here. So Chun Yu is asking, can non-music therapists perform music therapy for themselves? Um, you will notice that when we talk about our research and, you know, I have these wonderful students who are so passionate and interested about music therapy, but a lot of times when we are referring to the projects, we say music therapy based. And they are on the music therapy career pathway, which means they are learning and they're getting to know what music therapy is about. But we are not by any way qualifying them to be music therapists at this level. At the same time, are they able to use music therapy if they're not trained as music therapists? That's not likely because you need to be trained as a music therapist to know how to administer music therapy properly. On the other hand, there are music therapists who are working in Malaysia. And if anybody is interested to work with a music therapist, I would encourage you to get in touch with, you know, there's UPM here, which we are coming in more from the education side, but there's also the Malaysian Music Therapy Association. And you should actually go and seek them out because then you'll get access to proper music therapy support. Okay. One more question. Is it tough being a music therapist? Would you like to um, answer that question, Bobby and Angie? You're not yet music therapists, but I know you're aspiring to be music therapists. But I see a lot of smiling. All I know is that no matter how much I challenge you and how much I really, really uh, obsess over your final year projects, you're smiling a lot. So anyway, I will give you a chance maybe to answer this question. Angie, you want to take this? <laughs> <laughs> um, is it hard to be a therapist? Um, actually, prior to attending Dr. Indra's um, courses uh, during our what second year or third year, like I have this preconception of what music therapy is, but then when I actually go into it, it's totally a whole different thing, you know. And to be honest, yes, it is tough because it's so different from what we are actually learning. Uh, with our peers, for example, like performances or composition. It's like a whole different um, dimension. But at the end of it, if you really have the passion for this, then I think it's a good um, specialized career pathway for you to go. And as for me, even though it's tough, but I enjoy it. And I would, I would rather see the fruits at the end of my hard work and, you know, be uh be happy with it yeah so what about you bobby <laughs> she's not gonna let you escape bobby yeah i i noticed that uh is it tough being a music therapy uh music therapy student at least yes that's it uh, <laughs> uh well good news is um for, since a lot of people here are from usm doing the music uh program um being a music therapy student means uh you won't get uh, comments like, oh, you're, you're doing music, then you're definitely going to be an artist. <laughs> or you're going to be a teacher. That's it. That's usually, that's always the pathway. Uh, but on a more serious note, yeah, it is, it is tough. It's, um, like Angie said, it's, it's insane to be uh, familiar with the terms like uh, stroke and Down syndrome and autism and dementia. And even dementia is like Alzheimer's and uh, Parkinson's and to learn all these things in such a small time and to be familiar with them in such a small time it's it's essentially what uh, Angie and I do and even our seniors like some of them actually work with uh, dyslexic kids in Bangi what we had to do is essentially read books from two fields or uh, um, my favorite is even from three fields so like uh, we have read a lot of books on uh, medicine not a lot of books and we that's that's the joke though we're not even medical students, we're not psychology students. Like I can uh, sit down and have a conversation with you about uh, psychoanalysis, Freud, Jung, uh, Karen Hornan, but I'm not a psychology student. 
and even more so, I'm not a medical student telling you about uh, uh, the cadence, the stride of people walking. Why is it that uh, uh, Parkinson's have uh, dysphagia, for example? But that's the fun thing. And like Angie said, it's tough, but it's also fun because we're not just music students going out to be performers or doing compositions and arrangements. We're doing that for the purpose of helping others in a more medical setting. Is it tough? Yeah. Is it fruitful? Yes. And is it worth it? Definitely. Very nice. Very good. Yeah. As long as you enjoy doing what you're doing, I don't think you'll see the tough in it, but you see the fruits at the end of it. Yeah. Good. Uh, I'm just amazed with the two of you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, Shireen wants to ask a question with audio. Yes, you can. Uh, go ahead, Shireen. I'm just browsing through. Um, sorry, I just and I just uh sent the you sent your question in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Then I will come to it. Um, there's a question from Chu Zhe Ying. The ages of the clients involved in music therapy is around which age? I always tell the students that. Uh, we work with clients from the womb to the tomb and everything in between. So there's actually a lot of work that's being done, especially overseas in the States, that works with premature infants. In fact, that's part of my training. I'm just not really using it in Malaysia right now. But you're talking about premature infants who were not born full term and music can already be used to help with their feeding behavior, to help them to decrease their sensory overload when they're born into an environment that's unfamiliar. So, you know, that's the youngest infants. At the same time, I know of colleagues who are working even when they are in utero. So, it actually runs the gamut all the way to death and dying. And there is hospice work. That's another important area of music therapy. Um, I got to do some of that when I was in the US. We're not quite doing it here right now. But there is literally music therapy applications for every stage and age throughout the human condition. Okay. Um, where are we now? How are the job opportunities like here in Malaysia for qualified music therapists? Um, I would say that it's a case of, um, there's definitely a demand for it, but there is still a lack of awareness of what music therapy is about. Uh, I'm thankful because a lot of the things that I'm doing actually are coming from requests either from healthcare settings or from special needs centers. And for me, it's all about opportunities to help our students to develop their skills so that one day they can then go on to uh, fulfill that demand because there's definitely interest but many people still have a very very wrong conception about what music therapy is yes, yes. and our job as a university is is not to penalize it's not to uh, sort of divide between who is a music therapist and not so much as we are here to educate we're here to empower and so what we are about is creating opportunities to also help the general public to help people who may be potential employers organizations to learn more about music therapy and inevitably what we are thankful is that when they give us a chance to go and demonstrate music therapy, there will always be some interest to see whether we can create jobs. So I would say the prospects are very good. Uh, the fact that the Ministry of Health actually got in touch with UPM and asked whether we can yeah. focus now on developing a program because they want to generate a workforce, I think it's a strong enough indication that there is a need and there is an interest for more music therapists to be hired in our healthcare industry. Very true. Very, very true. Um, okay, one question about music therapy being suitable for animals. <laughs> um, a few years back, I actually had students from the veterinary faculty coming over to my intro to music therapy course and asking whether there was something they could do. The fact that you are talking about music being used in some form um, therapeutically to soothe the pain and to perhaps help to reduce some of the trauma that an animal might be experiencing. I, I don't think that's totally off limits, but for now, at least the field of music therapy is primarily being developed for humans. And uh, who is to say in the future, there's research being done to see whether music can be used to enhance the growth of plants, to actually exactly. improve the yield of crops. So the sky is the limit. Correct, correct. And we always see so many videos of animals reacting so amazingly to just 
music and sound for that matter. Actually, you know, yes. that's a very interesting point that you're mentioning, Prabina, mm -hmm. because I, I have a group of older adults that I work with and some of them are animal lovers and they used to tell me things like, you know, what you taught me in uh, our music class, I actually went home and tried to do some music with my dog or, you know, and then she sleeps better now. Yeah, so it's like, who, who am I to deny that? Because that is something which is a very personal experience and if it true. really, really helps to improve the quality of sleep. For Why her. not? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Correct. True. Um, okay, moving on. We've got quite a few questions suddenly. All right, this is a question for Angie. I once attended a conference session by a therapist who explained that the therapist's methodology, music for example, is less important than the relationship that develops between therapists and the patient. Do you see any limitations that um, teletherapy may impose on this relationship? Uh, hi, John. Um, actually, I was typing to send it to him privately while uh, we were answering these questions. But um, of course, there will be limitations on teletherapy, uh, such as the latency of internet and the inability to support to physically support your clients and have that interactions to see each other face-to-face. Uh, -face. But nonetheless, um, relationships and um, the methodology, it comes, it sort of comes like hand in hand in my personal view. And it's like, um, yeah, oh, wait, hold on. Let me read that again. <laughs> so, um, because even with the even now we are doing it in Zoom, right? It does not mean that um, our relationships um, with the clients, or let's say the therapist relationships with the clients, um, sort of de um, gone bad or decreased. But it sort of we can still do it because that is um, we still have to find ways in a sense because there is um, there's this pandemic going on and. There are some things that we we unable to do it by ourselves because of this pandemic. But at the end of it, we still have to find ways to um, to interact with each other, and uh, yeah, to interact with each other. So I don't know if I could really explain. Maybe Bobby, you want to uh, help back me up on this because I'm very bad at explaining. So yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I understand what you're trying to say. It's because that glass, it seems to prevent us from having a full-fledged relationship, a therapeutic relationship with our clients. So there will be a limiting factor of whereby I'm not really looking at you into your eyes because there's a psychological effect of looking a person, you know, into their eyes. And um, I mean, obviously, without the COVID issues, like touching their arms and actually giving them a gentle nudge and you know, positive affirmation and all the psychological uh, uh, approaches. So yeah, like NGA, it is a limiting factor to have a screen between us and I can't just like, oh, I can't just like rub this camera and whatever and, and reach out to you on the other side. That's the limiting factor. Yeah, I think there's always a boundary when there's no human interaction, especially when the word therapy is involved, isn't it? There's always a personal yeah. connection that you want or need to establish with the person you're working with. Yeah. Yeah. So but, even psychological things like, sorry, uh, even psychological things like uh, a, a lot of therapy, psychological therapy, actually uh, CBT, like cognitive behavioral therapists, always use uh, affirmation, affirmation, affirmation. Yeah. So, but it's harder. It's much, much harder. There are researchers that look into it, but it's much more difficult. Right. Okay, thank you guys. I hope that answers the question. Um, Chien would like to know, is it known, sorry, it is known that music therapy is a treatment for mental health or psychological issues. Is there any research or possibilities that music therapy can be used to treat physical health issues like cancer, etc.? So music therapy is actually used uh, with different levels of functioning and we treat physical symptoms as much as we may use music to intervene with mental health issues. Uh, there's a whole area of music therapy in cancer care that actually already exists. And so if you're interested in that, I would just encourage you to go and Google and you will definitely come across some ways that music has been therapeutically applied to help with cancer patients. Um, 
I think a lot of people are sometimes maybe confused because they hear music therapy being used a lot in mental health settings. And right now with COVID and all the issues that are emerging because of COVID, there's more talk about mental health. But one of the things that we notice is when we are using music to administer to a human being, anything from their physical to their cognitive to their emotional to their social behavioral aspects of functioning could potentially be positively influenced through music therapy okay actually may i add on for that one yeah sure. if you don't mind Dr. yeah uh so there's two sides with this uh the mental health and psychological issues side and the physical issues the like doctor industry there's a lot of researchers that looks into mental health or psychological issues using music therapy interventions. And this actually related to the next question, the behavioral correction, especially in mentally disturbed people. So yeah, there are actually researchers done by, for example, uh, Professor Katrina McFerrin in uh, University, University of Melbourne. Melbourne. Yeah, that's the one. And she actually does uh, mental health studies with adolescents. And there's also another research in Norwegia in the uh, prison. And that's actually, I, I had a discussion uh, uh, with a friend about somebody who teaches music in Henry Gurney in Malaysia and if it's possible to work to, together. And she said, yeah, it could be possible. I think that one's further down the line. So there are actually different manners to tap into the mental health or psychological issues or the behavioral correction uh, aspects in uh, therapy, using music therapy, but it's all different approaches. Like, again, there's uh, the psychoanalysis, that's the Sigmund Freud sitting down and, you know, discussing about uh, all, that the, all that the clients sing to and play to, that's the psychoanalysis part. Or there is the ecological part whereby the bigger picture is actually uh, looked into with the music that we play and so on and so forth. And yeah, like Dr. Indra said, you can actually Google this. And the other side is the physical health. And the physical health, this one, I love it so much because that's a very important uh, aspect to my research and as well as uh, another research done by Dr. Ang Mei Fong in UPM. She actually talks about um, uh, vocal rehabilitation, which is a, a physical aspect. And yes, music therapy can actually look into uh, rehabilitating, vocal rehabilitation. There was somebody that asked me about, uh, privately that asked me about uh, working with uh, Parkinson's clients, there's actually another research that looks into rhythmic auditory stimulation uh, by Michael Thought in 2014 that helps uh, the movements, the cadence, the strides, the cross motor of uh, Parkinson, not only Parkinson's, of course that one is only uh, for the Parkinson's clients, but that looks into the gross motor movements of the clients using you know, drumming based music therapy that specifically for me but using the rhythm element in music okay all right i hope that answers adam's question um we're a bit pressed for time so we'll move on um where are we now melissa how does music therapy assess and decide the most effective methods of program type or therapy to administer and conduct so you will need to come for a whole program of training for us to appropriately answer that question. Um, and there are many, many different techniques, approaches that are used for assessment and also to develop a whole program. So if you are thinking along those lines, um, you're actually talking about a comprehensive approach to not only assessing in the moment, but on an ongoing basis. So. It's very hard to answer that question just like that. We will need a whole session, but there are methods, there are approaches, and there are techniques available specifically for assessment. Um, you guys have, those of you, I know the music students are burning with questions and I can see them coming through, but if I'm not able to cover everything today and if Dr. Indra is not able to cover everything, um, I'm, I'm sure if they could drop you an email with questions or if there's something that they are not sure about, um, Dr. Indra's email is available on UPM's website, mm -hmm. but I could also give it to y'all. And um, if you're interested to further see how music therapy is one of the pathways that you are interested in to probably pursue, or it's something that you're interested in, uh, by all means, go ahead and drop her an email. Yeah. So I will just go through um, Rachel. What are some of the methods to assess patients' progress after they have undergone music therapy? 
we do ongoing monitoring um, as far as assessment goes. So there could be behavioral observation, there can be feedback. We usually use a variety of different indicators. So it really depends on what kind of intervention we're delivering and then what is the most effective way for us to be able to um, predict whether the goals, whatever treatment objectives we have, have been met. So that's another comprehensive question. And if you're already asking me questions like that, it sounds like you are looking at ways that music not only asserts an effect, but are there ways for us to actually monitor and track the progress? So we know that in the end, the music therapy intervention, whatever music therapy stimulus has been used, has actually asserted a uh, effect. And yes, it's a very, very big part of the training as far as becoming a music therapist. Okay. Um, where are we? Adam said I missed his question. So let's see. Adam, is this the one? Is there potential for music therapy to be used for behavioral, collect behavioral correction, especially in mentally disturbed people? I think Bobby answered that to a certain extent. Yeah. So there is, yes, yes um, there is possibility and he actually gave a nice elaboration on how that can actually work and the research that ex that's actually been conducted in that area, yeah. Um, where are we now? Um, I think there's a, Tian, Tian Yun would like to reach out to Bobby and uh, Angie personally to ask about their research. So if you guys are okay to share your emails. Probably, I think there's more questions on what you're doing because I think it's really amazing. I was very impressed with the kind of work you're doing at an undergraduate level. Yeah, so that's very nice. I think um, huge kudos to Dr. Indra on helping you all guide, guide you all the right way and being able to quote some of the most influential works of, you know, cutting edge <laughs> research on music therapy out there is impressive, very impressive. Okay, yeah. Shireen, is, sorry? Can I, can I just give a shout out? Because UPM is not the only university that is um, doing some form of music therapy exposure for students. There are also colleagues in HELP University who are very much coming from a counselling perspective, who are looking at the psychological aspects, who I think also deserve a mention because there are courses being run as part of their uh, master's programme, which give students at Help University an insight, but their specialty goes a lot into counselling and psychology. Right. So the exciting thing for me is that now in Malaysia, we have all these different options different for us to, yes. yes. And I think we should all be building our strengths because Definitely. so much more is needed. And uh, I just wanted to mention that so that people don't think that it's only UPM <laughs> uh, because Help University is also doing something. Yes. Wonderful. Um, I think the, the, one, the work that UPM is doing that's very different is the, the focus that is on music therapy. I think that that's the focus that you guys are taking and spearheading that. But like you said, Health University is also doing other therapeutic work in different areas. And I think it's very important that we acknowledge and also work together mm -hmm. so that you don't miss out and single out anybody thinking that that's the only area that's important. Exactly. Yes. Um, Shireen says, I attended a webinar before on mental health professionals' roles and how they act together as a team. I was wondering, how do music therapists work together with counsellors, um, psychologists, and psychiat psychiatrists to provide the best care for a client? What role in this team do music therapists play? It really depends on the setting and the setup of that particular um, healthcare organization, music therapists are trained to be able to administer music therapy in a way that supports mental health needs. So we can work independently. But ideally, because some of these conditions are complex, like I've done work together with the Malaysian Mental Health Association. So I'm working together with psychologists, with psychiatrists. And so we are very much working as a collaborative team. And I think that is usually more effective because the more we can combine strengths, it means we can amplify the positive impact of the intervention. So again, depending on the setup in that organization, some organizations already have multidisciplinary teams on board. Others will contract externally. 
Um, but as far as possible, unless it is inevitable and you have to deal with the client one-to-one, -one, whenever I can, because I'm thinking about what's the optimum outcome for the patient. If it's a mental health issue, I always enjoy working alongside a psychologist, even though I know that I could be using just purely music therapy training, and there are techniques for that, but it's only so that you know, again, thinking about what's in the best interest of the client. Um, I have all these different collaborations that we have been working hard in UPM to set up, whether it's the Parkinson's Disease Association now with the dementia work with the Alzheimer's Disease Foundation or even Mental Malaysian Mental Health Association. I'm also working with the Malaysian Society for Music and Medicine, apart from the international collaborations. So this brings together the different expertise. And I feel that there are certain strengths about working within those multidisciplinary contexts. But music therapy is actually very versatile and able to work alongside all these other therapies. That's true, yes. Um, just a couple more questions. Music therapy sounds awesome in mental treatment. Do you think music therapy can substitute or rely on the rely of medicines to treat mental disorder of patients? So one of the things that uh, when we are looking at why is it there is often a lot of encouragement to try to find non-pharmacological alternatives within medical treatment. It's because sometimes what is really, really unfortunate is many of these medications, which are the primary go-to as part of treatment, have side effects. So very often when we are bringing in interventions like music therapy, when we are using other forms of alternative therapies, is also to see if we can try and reduce the dependency on medication alone. And there's a lot of research that's being done in the States, you know, spearheaded by the American Music Therapy Association, that looks into ways that we can help to reduce some of these negative side effects so there's less dependency on medication. Now, whether it can replace it completely, it's a very subjective thing because different people will have different reactions to yes, medication. True. So I would say that as far as possible, if we can find a way to reduce the dependency on medication, that's definitely a good thing. Wonderful. Um, just one question from Anas here. How does music therapy work on patients with hearing problems? There's actually another whole branch <laughs> of music therapy looking at hearing impairments. And they might be using vibrations, they are using um, spatial orientation just to help uh, clients who have hearing impairment find other ways to compensate. So if they have residual hearing, because we are not just talking about profound deafness as if the person has absolutely no way of sensing uh, any kind of vibration or sound. So there's different levels as well. But interestingly, um, that work is still emerging in Malaysia. I know of um, some schools who are working with visual impairment, but I would say hearing impairment is still very much not an area that many music therapists have been really going to in Malaysia. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Indra. Um, okay. If we don't have any more questions, is that I hope I didn't miss anybody's questions. Um, I had a few questions in, I think most of the questions that were, <laughs> I sent Dr. Indra some questions in advance, but most of them were already asked. Uh, I really, really hope you guys found this session interesting and in informative because I, for one, sin sincerely did. There's just so much of work that's being done out there in the field of music therapy. And it's a very miss, it's an area that has a lot of misconception. And it's, a, it's such a generalized term that everybody who does some form of music and does some form of therapy or healing or, you know, any form of that things that they're doing music therapy, but it's, it's actually a very specialized field that requires a lot of research and a lot of ethical approach that has to be adhered to because you're dealing, as Dr. Indra said, vulnerable people, and you want to make sure that you're creating the best solutions for whatever problems or issues or, you know, things that they might already be facing and not wanting to cause any more harm to that. So it was a very interesting session, um, a, a good insight into what we are doing in Malaysia and also what everybody else is doing elsewhere. If you guys have more questions on, on the future of music therapy or if you're interested to actually pursue something in music therapy in a postgraduate level, or if you even want to work with Dr. Indra in something that she's already doing, um, I'm sure she's happy to hear from you. Can drop her an email with further questions. She is 
extremely swamped from the work that she's currently involved in. But um, knowing her from the years that I've known her, she's happy to help. Yeah, she's, yeah, she's always eager to help those who have got questions. So I would just like to send a very big thank you to everyone. For the USM Music students, just stay on the line. I will be giving you your link for your CPD points. Um, I will send it in the chat. But we will say thank you and um, goodbye to Dr. Indra. Bobby? Yeah, me. Yes, just, um, please. One last thing. I oh, sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, somebody actually asked, like, uh, where can we find uh, our researchers for, for me and Angie? Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to clarify that we are still in our data collection phase. Mm -hmm. And we're still, like, um, uh, yeah, we're carrying out our research. It's just that because of COVID, we've been held back. We're supposed to be, like, well into the you know write up stage and into the submission stage before next year just that because of covid so we've been really like um backlogging a lot of work and but yeah that uh that that calls for more advocacy to actually look to other researchers for now until we're able to get our works out there okay yeah just a heads up for everyone all right okay okay so when are you guys due to finish then uh, are you all graduating next year Yeah. We're hoping to finish by February. Uh, we'll, be doing okay. our, we'll be doing our next presentation uh, mm -hmm. probably in early early January. And, so, then, and then you guys graduate yeah, next year. Yeah. Uh, we will finish our semester by February and then we'll continue on with our internship mm -hmm. uh, for the next semester and then we'll graduate. Okay, so you're in the four-year program, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay, okay. Right. To honestly answer you, uh, when we were hoping to send in our work, I don't know, July this year. Yeah, it all depends. <laughs> right now. It's so subjective <laughs> and everything has been gone into a huge roller coaster that doesn't seem yes. to end. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Yes, but I wish the two of you all the very best. It has been such a privilege listening to the two of you share. Um, I hope the USM students... Um, I, I think it was wonderful that Dr. Indra got undergraduate students to share because... You guys have been just hearing from us as lecturers, but it's nice to see what your fellow peers are doing um, in different parts, just as how like, um, us researchers like to know what researchers are doing everywhere else. I think as students, you also like to know what your peers and undergraduate friends are doing in different universities. And this was a really nice sharing session of the work that you're doing. And it's very important work. So I really thank you very much for taking your time, putting your slides together, getting your research in order and presenting it in such a cohesive and clear manner. So thank you very much. Very, 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 um, I don't know, I'm saying very proud, but yes, <laughs> Dr. Indra should be very proud of the work you all have done and are doing. So I am very proud of them. Um, yes, you should be. I'm, I'm I also amazed. hope that this is an encouragement to all our students because we are here as part of a big family, really, interested in ways that we can use music therapy, we can research about music therapy and learn more about music therapy. And the only way we are going to move forward as a whole community is to do more research, to go and get more training. And so the universities are here very much to help in those endeavors. It's not just UPM, but USM as well. In fact, one of the things that um, I hope that you are inspired by is as much as you see Bobby and Angie's passion, I was listening very closely when uh, they were answering about whether it's tough. The reality <laughs> is, it is tough. It is tough, yes. It is tough, but it's so rewarding, you know, and I'm sure they will tell you that, you know, we push ourselves hard, but it's not because we are, you know, in any way just liking to torture ourselves. It's because we genuinely believe in what we're doing and we find it really rewarding and enjoyable when we see the results. I think the best part Correct me if I'm wrong, Bobby and Angie, is when we've done all that preparation, we've done all that hard work, and then we go out and do the outreach, and we go into the rehab facility, and we do the actual activities with the patients, and you see their response. And to me, that is actually a very, the very important... Body. Yeah, because it makes everything you did worth because it. Because that's why you're doing it, isn't it? You're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for them. And when the appreciation... And actually, it's not so much the appreciation of thank you. It's a simple smile on the face... That, that says so much. It does. And, you know, yeah. the students have been wonderful. And I really, really want to commend Bobby and Angie for being so open-minded and being willing to go through all the rigors of training that we put them through. And 
you know, they do this so willingly and so sincerely. So yes, I'm genuinely very proud of them. And my encouragement is, I hope there will be more students. We should be collaborating as universities. We should be coming together because this will benefit the whole community. Definitely. That's very, very true. Very yeah, but uh, adding on on what Dr. Indra said, <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, I know I'm supposed to stop talking by now. It's just <laughs> it's a very very important heads up that I know uh, you know diploma years, degree years. A lot of us are just going through the motions with being a music student, and it's so. I'm not saying it's easy or it's harder or whatever, but music is music in all its sense. And you know, going into this research uh, a pathway, we can read ten thousand papers, if not hundreds of thousands. But when it actually gets into it be prepared to actually, you know, be in the motion of uh, helping vulnerable people and, you know, being very open with people, being, uh, not having a facet, not having, because you're not, a, uh, you're not a performer anymore. You know, you're not uh, all that time going into uh, harmony and all this jazz theory and all this like intense training. It's not about us anymore. It's about them. And I think me personally, uh, the first part is what all uh, what was said by Dr. Indra, but the scariest part is seeing these people actually there asking for help and me not knowing what to do. And I think that's like scared, scared me like really. That's the learning process. Yes, ma'am. Yes, that is. That and is it's the also learning process. I don't, just think, the Dr. I don't think even Dr. Indra has come to a point where she has the answers just like that. She still has, I think she still has situations or instances where she's also a little bit thrown off guard. I think that's where the learning happens. It's a constant yeah. thing. Yes. And as long as we are wanting to do the best for the patients, then the onus is on us to continue to develop our skills. Yes. And I think the encouragement that I can give you is it's worth it, you know, when you do the work and you really, really can see the difference in the patients. That's what it's all about. Thank you so much, right. Praveena, for no giving problem. us this platform so and opportunity. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Um, um, I will be in touch because I'm sure I won't stop here. I will have more work that I'd like to and love to collaborate with and work on. Looking so, forward to it. Yes. So I really want to thank the three of you all for taking the time on a, set, a Wednesday afternoon. I know everybody's stuck at home, but thank you so much for your time and your sharing and all the answers, you know, patiently answering everything. Thank you very, very much. Our pleasure, Praveena. Right. Thank you for having us. No problem. Thanks, guys.